Hi everyone, my name is Mike Sylvester, a 48-year-old aortic dissection, aortic aneurysm, heart attack, and stroke survivor. I'm here today to tell my story. My story begins back in December 2016, watching a hockey game on a Friday night, and I had what I thought was maybe some minor indigestion. Took some antacids and it didn't help. I thought I'd be all right and I was getting ready to go to bed. My wife was working, doing some all night lockdown contract negotiations. So she wasn't at home. So after doing some internet searches, I kept coming up with signs of a heart attack. So I thought I better, better go to the hospital. So I drove myself in. I got to the hospital and they did some quick tests and they said I was suffering from a heart attack. I had an 80% blockage and a certain artery in my heart and said they'd put me on blood thinners and it was pretty late at night by that time. They'd do stent surgery in the morning and I'd be out in a couple of days. Well, that was the last thing I remember. I woke up about three and a half weeks later. I had had an aortic dissection. My aorta dissected all the way from the root all the way to my iliacs. And it was so bad, the tear that they left the true and the false lumen both open together, so blood flows through both, and they call it, jokingly, the double-barreled shotgun. And thankfully for my cardiologist, following my stent surgery, I came back and I was recovering, telling everybody how good I felt, and then I started vomiting. I was sweating profusely, I was in a lot of pain, I was disoriented. Medical professionals were saying that there that it was probably the results of the anesthesia wearing off from the stent surgery, and that I'd be all right and just to let it run its course. The cardiologist looks at my wife and says, we need to run one more test. I gotta rule something out. And I asked him later on, what were you thinking at that point? And he said, well, I was thinking aortic dissection. I said, how did you know that? He said, I recognize the signs. He said, I was pretty sure, so I followed you down to the CT scanner. And I waited by the computer monitor for the image to come up. I saw it come up, I saw the dissection, saw it was bad. And I knew he had to do something. And I thanked him for saving my life. And he said, the only reason you're alive is because we scrambled the surgical team and basically in record time. And from the time I saw that dissection until the moment we were opening you up on the operating table was a very, very short period of time. So I woke up about three and a half weeks later and all I had was a series of hallucinations and nightmares to remember from the opioids and the painkillers and I had liver failure, kidney failure. My blood pressure was about 190 over 120 following surgery. They couldn't get the blood pressure down. And there you can see me in the hospital bed clinging to life. I had a blood infection. I had all kinds of secondary issues. Uh, every time they pulled out the ventilator, my lungs collapsed and I couldn't breathe. They'd put it back in, but they don't want to keep you on that forever. So they take it out and it collapse again. This went on for about three and a half weeks. And one day, just suddenly I woke up. And there really was no explanation, but just woke up. And uh, they sent me to intermediate care. They started explaining to me exactly what had happened. And of course, I had this sternotomy. My stomach had been opened up. I was in a lot of pain and said I'd be in intermediate care for a month. I was in intermediate care for about a week, week and a half, and they said, we're going to move you into, uh, into Miller Dwan Polinsky Rehab Facility. That's our wonderful facility here at Essentia Health in Duluth, Minnesota. And so they moved me in there and said, you'll be here a couple of months. I was there about a month and a half and found out exactly what an aortic dissection was and how serious it was. And it ended up being related most likely to my unchecked high blood pressure and probably some really bad genetics and the stress of the stent surgery. So I had to work super hard in rehab and there I am on the bike, biking away. And after a month and a half or so, I got to go home. And they were sure if I was maybe ever going to walk on my own again or go back to work. I'm a letter carrier at the postal, with the postal service here in Duluth. And I went back to work about a month and a half to two months after my dissection. They were just amazed. So 
everything was going really well and life was really good. And that was December, or that was 2017. That would have been March of 2017. Then in June of 2018, I had a follow-up CT scan and got a call from the nurse in cardiothoracic and said, Mike, you need to come meet with the doctor tomorrow at one. He wants to talk with you. And I didn't really know what it was about. Showed up in my postal uniform and sat down and the doctor looks at me and says, well, you've developed new multiple, multiple new aneurysms in your aorta and you're going to need a couple of surgeries and they're going to be really bad. And I said, wait a minute here. No, no, no. I, I'm good to go. You know, everything, uh, everything went well for me and, you know, I'm, I'm all healed up. And he explained that because the dissection and tear was so bad, it had weakened the overall strength of the aorta. So my arch needed to be totally rebuilt and I was going to need some stent grafts inserted into my descending aorta. So they got together with Gore Biomedical and they custom designed a Dacron Gore-Tex Titanium Reinforced Aortic Arch. And here it is. And behind that is the sketch of the surgical plan the surgeon made. So there you can see the stent graft that is now my arch. And I also needed to have some preliminary surgeries on my neck. You can see the scars they needed to bypass and transpose my subclavian and carotid arteries so they can insert stent grafts in through my neck and in through my femoral arteries as well. And that way they could avoid the, the shark bite surgery and do it with only a vascular approach. So I thought, well, that wouldn't be too bad. I had the two preliminary surgeries. Those went okay. And then it came time for the planning for the big final surgery. And they didn't want to have me on the bypass machine for so long and everybody out there probably knows about post perfusion syndrome or pump head as they call it and it's a very real and I had some minor issues after my first surgery so they said what we're going to do instead of that we're going to chill your body down till it's hypothermic then we're going to cut off your blood flow then we won't have to put you on the bypass machine we'll just work on your aorta directly and when we're done we'll warm you back up we'll start the blood flow up again and things will be good so I remember going in for the surgery and then putting warm blankets over my legs and looking up at the ceiling and thinking, is this, is going, to be the, is this going to be the last thing I see on this earth, this ceiling of the surgical room? And the next thing I remember is the surgeon waking me up and saying, Mike, surgery's over. Everything went really well. The stent grafts all got put in and life is, you should be good to go and be able to get back to your life here pretty soon. And the surgery was like, 12 or 15 hours and I had started early in the morning I fell asleep and then fast forward to the next day and I hear the neurologist is here and I hear the neurologist say yeah it was a stroke and it was really a bad stroke what had happened in the time my blood was circulation was shut off developed a clot somewhere and when my circulation got started up again that clot lodged in my right middle cerebral artery and that cut off blood to my brain for a significant period of time. And anywhere in your body, if your cells don't get blood, they die. And they die very quickly and your brain is no different. And it's funny because everybody, a lot of my friends and relatives have always well said, well, it grows back, doesn't it? And no, it's not the lawn. It's not your hair. Once you have damage to those brain cells, they're gone. It's as if they open up your skull and cut that part of your brain out and threw it away. And there you can see the image and the huge part of the right side of my brain that is no longer viable. So I woke up and I had no use of my left arm or left leg. I couldn't see and I couldn't speak. And I got sent to intermediate care for a couple of days and then back to the Miller Dwan Polinsky Rehab Facility for... Um, they didn't know how long, and they told me later on, after I'd been there a few months, that they didn't think I'd ever get out of a wheelchair, and they thought that I would spend the rest of my life in a nursing home. I'd need 24-7 care because there was no possible way I was going to recover. And I worked super hard right away in therapy, and here you can see there I am on the bike. 
They'd tell me go level two for 10 minutes, I'd go level five for 20. Whatever they said to do, I'd double it. And I worked super hard. And eventually after a couple of weeks, I got out of the wheelchair and I got into a walker. I was, had a walker for a few weeks and stumbled around. It seemed like a drunken fool. You know, if I had a nickel for every time I fell with that thing, I'd be sitting on a beach in Tahiti somewhere. So after a few weeks at the walker, I walked into PT and my PT woman says, give me your walker. And I said, I can't give it to you. I need this. She said, not anymore. Start walking on your own two legs. She says, we'll use the gate belt and you can use the railings. And again, I stumbled around like a drunken sailor and falling and getting up and falling and getting up. And I was a hockey player as a kid and through college and it almost my knees and elbows were sore. It was almost like I was starting over learning to skate again because wake up with bruises on my knees and elbows from falling so often. And so the therapies went on and on and on all day long, six days a week, up early in the morning and all day I would go through therapies, physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy, psych therapy and they just uh, were very difficult and very grueling. I would just be exhausted and pass out when they were done at the end of the day. At night, I would spend the nights walking the halls because I knew I had to get stronger. So I would walk the halls all night long and they would say, Mike, go back to your room. It's three in the morning. I'd say, I got to walk. Can you put some coffee on for me? I'd say, caffeine isn't good for your heart. How about just a cup? Okay, then go back to your room. Then I just keep walking all night long. Then it'd be six, seven in the morning. Then it'd be time for breakfast. Then it'd be time for therapy. And that went on. And they thought I would, again, be there a few months. I was in the Miller-Dwan-Polinsky rehab facility for about exactly one month. And they thought I would never get out of that wheelchair. And I walked out the front door on my own. And there I am, January 26th. 2019. Got admitted to the facility December 26, 2018. Walked out the front door, continued in outpatient therapies, and you know, it gets better every day. There's still issues, but here we are in April of 2019, and I recently found out I've been cleared to go back to work at the Postal Service, received uh, my driving privileges Again, back again after behind the wheel test and some other therapies, so I'm able to drive now, and they're totally shocked at that. And uh, all I need to do is one more CT scan, and they've got to get an image and make sure all the hardware they put in me is still in place. And then I have a blood drawn and echocardiogram and some other tests, and once that clears, I'll be going back to work. So pretty amazing. The neurologist was so shocked. He said, Initially, they told me I was a one in a million. He told me, you're not a one in a million. You're one in a hundred million. If a hundred million people had what you had, maybe one person would recover. So I feel very fortunate for the care I've received here. And it's been really, really a long road and a lot of pain and suffering along the way. And a lot of self-doubt too. And, you know, self-pity and depression. And I know a lot of you out there are thinking the same thing. And, you know, there's an easy way around that. Is just think of what other person's shoes you'd rather walk in for a day or a week. Because believe me, there are people worse than me out there, and I saw them every day in therapy. So before you start feeling sorry for yourself or getting depressed, realize there are other people that have it a lot worse off. So once I realized that, that kind of got me around the self-pity and the depression, and I just realized life goes on. I've been dealt this hand. All I can do is play with it. There's nothing else I can do. I got the cards around the table, make my bets and let the chips fall where they may. And, you know, and then life goes on and I'm just going to work hard and do the best I can and work hard in my therapies. And here's a CT scan that I had. You can see that arch they rebuilt. Amazing. It's like science fiction. There it is. The CT scan of my arch in place. Not really even sure how that's possible. That got shoved in through my femoral artery. And they shoved. Also, I had a de couple of descending stents. There's a shot scan you can see they're pointing at is the descending stent. The top of it, it goes down through my aorta, the upper part to the descending stent. Initially, when I had my first repair, it was the ascending repair, the Dacron sheet. They 
had fixed that. So that, that is still in place, but they rebuilt the arch and then they put these descending stents in and have told me, you know, those things are built to last a thousand years because I was worried, how long are these good for? And they said, in a thousand years, your body will be nothing but dust. And if somebody exhumed it from a casket, they'd find just dust and bone fragments in there and they'd find those stent grafts and they'd look pretty much like they do right now. So they're built to last, they said, about a thousand years. So here I am, return to work and ready to return to work and driving again and feeling so fortunate and... You know, it's uh, every one of these aortic dissections and aneurysms and surgeries are different. Every single person's story is different. Some are a lot more tragic than others, and some are stories of their friends or relatives. And, you know, I was fortunate enough that my cardiologist said, we need to run one more test. I think something else is going on. And, you know, the awareness now that people have for aortic dissections is amazing. And then to get the CT scans and find the aneurysms and have a plan to get those fixed. And I didn't have to have the shark bite surgery. I was able to have the vascular approach. So yeah, I had the stroke and it was bad, but your body has an amazing ability called neuroplasticity. Like I tell the doctor, you know what? My brain's so powerful. Other people might need four or five brains to function. I need half of one, that's it. I got neuroplasticity. And the healthy side of my brain is going to take over. It's like being a factory worker and somebody else calls in sick. So you say, hey, I got your back. I'll take care of your job today. That's what the left side of my brain is doing. And I'm walking fine, seeing fine. And obviously, as you can see, talking fine. So it is amazing, the whole neuroplasticity thing. And, you know, again, nobody can believe it. it's like science fiction, those stent graphs and what they've put into me and the fact that... Uh, they're functioning as uh, they're supposed to and feeling so fortunate and lucky to, to be where I am. And, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to do this video is because I know so many, out of you, oh, so many of you out there are hurting or your family member or friends are hurting. They've had dissection or aneurysm-related issues in their aorta. And, you know, you just got to know that hope and faith are powerful things. If you have hope and you have faith, you can really overcome a lot. So you have to have both. And don't ever let anybody limit you or tell you what you can't do or what you shouldn't do. Know your body and be smart. Obviously, I'm not going to go out and run 100 miles and chop 1,000 cords of wood. But, you know, you have to be willing to push it a little bit and know your limits and push them a little bit if you want to get stronger. And don't let anybody limit you or tell you that you'll never be able to do this again. You'll never be able to go back to work. You'll never be able to walk. You'll never be able to get out of a wheelchair. You'll never be able to function as a normal human being. When you start to believe when people say those negative things, you just create the self-fulfilling prophecy and you just doom yourself. So you have to have hope and faith and you have to believe and you have to work hard. And if you do those things, maybe like me, you'll find the light at the end of the tunnel. Thanks for watching, everybody. Have a great day.